Good evening, everyone. My name's Lucy Hobbs. I'm an Integration and Priority Populations Coordinator at Southwest Sydney Primary Health Network. Welcome to tonight's meeting, Syphilis and Congenital Syphilis, How to Treat, Test and Manage. Just a bit of housekeeping. So tonight's session will aim to provide GPs, midwives and nurses with a detailed snapshot of the current syphilis situation in New South Wales and why syphilis screening and testing is important. It will educate you on syphilis serology interpretation and provide an opportunity to discuss case studies from sexual health clinics, clinics and general practices which highlight the challenges of managing syphilis now it has re-emerged in the heterosexual community. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands of which we meet. For me in Redfern, that's the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome any First Nations people this evening. This session will be recorded. So we will be recording the session up until the end of the presentation tonight. The discussion following that will not be recorded. Everyone will be muted throughout the session. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and Cherie will be monitoring that chat box. Please inform us through the chat as well if you are sharing the same login with your colleague so that we can issue your certificates accordingly. This meeting is RACG approved for 1.5 educational activity hours. Please complete the online evaluation at the end of the session as your feedback will assist us in continually improving our programs. The link will be posted in the chat at the conclusion of this event. All participants are required to stay for the duration of the meeting to receive your certificate and RACGP approved hours. Certificates will be issued within one week. The GP feedback form can also be made available on request if anyone has any adverse feedback following this evening's meeting. I'd li now like to introduce our speakers. So welcome to Dr. Christopher Carmody, who is a sexual health physician with over 25 years experience in the sector of HIV AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases in clinics in Victoria and New South Wales. Dr. Carmody is a full-time senior staff specialist and medical director of sexual health services in Southwest Sydney Local Health District. Cherie Bennett is a passionate healthcare professional who has been working in the HIV, sexual health and viral hepatitis sector for over a decade. Her large portfolio of work spans a range of government, non-government, research and healthcare settings. As well as being a practicing clinical nurse, Cherie specializes in teaching, presentive and interactive facilitation, as well as providing operational analysis and policy review for healthcare settings to identify system gaps, opportunities and funding pathways. And welcome to Dr. Michelle Dunn, core ONG training at the Mercy in Victoria, ONG advanced training at Monash Hospital in Victoria, and fellowship at Westmead Hospital. Dr. Dunn completed her ONG training in 2022 and is currently a maternal fetal medicine subspecialty trainee at Liverpool Hospital. Welcome to tonight's panelists. Dr. Chris Carmody is going to commence. Um, so over to you. Thanks, Lucy, and um, for that, that wonderful introduction. And thanks to everyone online for joining tonight on what in Sydney has been a really, a very dramatic afternoon with um, an unseasonal uh, storm at the end, end of winter. So, um, and again, thanks to um, both Cherie and Michelle as uh, additional co-speakers tonight. So, okay, so, um, so tonight, we really wanted to have this session tonight because essentially how concerned we are about the uh, the increase in the numbers of cases of infectious syphilis and the the, the trend that's now happening and been happening for a while of um, increasing cases in with heterosexual transmission so okay so i just want to go to the next slide uh, just a quick reminder, so the bacteria, it's a Treponema pallidum, and it's a sexually transmitted subspecies of, um, of Treponema. Um, it's, got, it's got a long half-life, um, it's fastidious, hard to culture, 
a long incubation period and a long period of infectivity. And therein, with those sort of characteristics, lies some of our problems and our challenges. Um, transmission is between humans only, um, and it's direct contact with skin or, or mucous membranes. So in terms of sexual activity, that includes oral sex, vaginal sex, and, and anal sex. Um, and of course, some people uh, uh, overlook oral sex somewhat perhaps conveniently, or discount oral sex as being a sexual activity and therefore a sexual risk. Um, historically, syphilis was transmitted potentially through blood transfusions. And, and I'll come back to this point because our blood uh, supplies are still screened for syphilis. And of course, through pregnancy. So a huge focus uh, tonight. Um, commonly asymptomatic. Um, and I've just put in here that the risk groups are changing. So uh, we've, it's, Many, many of you will know that we've we've had uh, some troubles with syphilis uh, in our MSM and gay community for many, many years, and that's that is ongoing. Um, and but there are some differences, which I'll come back to later, and how that um, uh, impacts upon our our capacity really to make inroads into stopping the heterosexual uh, outbreaks that are occurring. Okay, so look, I've just put in here into, into the slide um, a, a graphic from the the national the Australian government's national campaign around syphilis, which was released uh, about a couple of years ago. Um, so it says, you know, don't fool around with syphilis. This is a, a caption, which of course is targeted at the, the broader community level. Um, but tonight, just to recap, we're, we're going to be focusing on infectious syphilis. So, so, you know, the primary, the secondary, and the early latent stage. And, and, and latent syphilis, by definition, is uh, that, that which is, uh, if occur, infections occurred you know, within the last two years. Um, and that's why you know, having access and being able to source previous serology is hugely advantageous so that we can, we can put a stage and a date to the infection. Okay, so all right. So, look, just um, we're we're going to come back to some clinical slides and some clinical cases. Um, and but before we do that, um, I'm we just need to go to some other graphs, which are just where we're up to with the with the epi at the moment uh, in New South Wales. So, but look, this is a case of secondary syphilis uh, uh, with some some mucus patches on on this this lady's. Uh, lips and genitalia, but I'm coming back to this case. This, these, all the cases I'm talking about are cases that I'm familiar with uh, at Liverpool Sexual Health, and which USGPs in some of the time have have referred to us. Um, okay, so uh, this is from the New South Wales Health website. Um, it's just a 10-year snapshot of the the trend in infectious syphilis um, and on the on the upper graph. Um, and as you can see, it's it, there's no bell shape here. It's it's continuing to increase. So basically, just to read you through it briefly, um, uh, you know, 10 years ago in 2012, 2013, there were, you know, 220, 250 cases or so. But these days we're we're just under a thousand cases every year of infectious syphilis uh, that are notified that is um, of course there are aren't there are, we don't know how many cases are not being recognized through diagnosis or they're not being screened for um, so but running parallel to that and and related to that of course is the the real problem the, the huge problem of a very preventable condition of congenital syphilis and so uh, if we took this graph back, actually, so the, I'm looking, talking about the lower graph now um, in orange. So uh, in New South Wales and in other states, indeed Victoria. Um, so we would have gone many, many years where we wouldn't have seen a congenital syphilis case. Um, but in the last, um, so, so since 2017, there's been, there's been around 12 notified cases of congenital syphilis in, in New South Wales. Um, so... So a very significant uh, um, increase and very concerning. And just to, another way of putting the upper graph is that the cases have doubled, infectious syphilis have doubled since 2016. Yeah. 
Um, this is just a graph that says the same thing a different way. So this is the the rate per 100,000 population, uh, which is how epidemiologists and public health folk who send you those notification forms um, uh, like to talk. So again, you can see that the rate was, you know, just under seven in 100,000 in 2012. And now we're sitting on around 22, 23 cases per 100,000 the last few years. So furthermore to that, this is uh, broken down by sex ratio, um, by, by sex. And on this graph, I do want to point, uh, whilst the bulk of the cases is within men, um, of concern, there's very steady and very significant in the, in the lower graph, in the, the darker line is the female graph, a very steady ongoing increase since 2016 of increasing notifications in, in women. So, uh, this, this last uh, epigraph is from our own health district here in Southwest Sydney. Um, and it maps out and, and credit to our acknowledgement to our local public health unit. This, um, this draws out the story for um, our own notification rate in, in Southwest Sydney. So again, the same picture. Um, so a very small base of, um, you know, around three, three to four um, cases per 100,000 population uh, in 2016 to sitting around between 11 and 12 uh, currently. And we know it's, th this is to the end of last year, there's always a lag with notification data for syphilis in particular, because there's a lot of work to be done with, with cleaning up the data and clarifying uh, case definitions. But I will add, it's very, very important work, and it's it's very, very important work uh, that G GPs and others uh, in health settings are contributing to, uh, and it's even it's even more important that we get the definitions right these days. Okay, so um, so just coming to uh, firstly just a recap of early syphilis, um, so acquired in the last two years. Um, and uh, so the main lesion, of course, is the Shanker, uh, uh, not always solitary, but there may be multiple um, and typically painless um, and, and, um, and sort of well-defined as opposed to herpes, so a well-defined and, uh, and on palpation with gloves, it's, it, with maturity of the lesion, the, the lesion will be firming up or will be indurated. Um, starts off though as a papule then to an ulcer and, and that's therein lies the problem because some patients uh, don't take too much notice of a papule or discount it or think it's a result of trauma or uh, from shaving or waxing or so on and this can be the case with women as well uh, at the genital site or the or the mouth um, um, uh, not infrequently you'll find that there's an associated solitary unilateral a squash ball like node um, in the inguinal region. Um, and that's you know, um, often found. Um, a short incubation, short, relatively short incubation period, so around three weeks on average, but with a range of up to three months. Um, the Shanka is very infectious. Um, and we diagnose that you know, on a, a PCR swab looking for the DNA, the treponeme, and, uh, and, and, and setting about starting our serology. Tonight, I am going to cover serology, so we're coming back to that, and I'm hoping to, to demystify some of that for you. Yeah. Okay, so, so what about secondary syphilis? So we've been seeing you know, a lot of secondary syphilis um, in our clinic, and it's not only in the MSM or, or, gay, or gay men. Um, so the incubation period, it's odd, typically it's you know, four to ten weeks after the primary lesion. Um, and a way to think about secondary syphilis is that it is the hematogen, the spread of the bacteria. So it is potentially a disseminated infection, and hence that's why we get these uh, sometimes widespread manifestations, manifestations including a rash. Um, so, but so a rash is the most common thing that we'll see. So a trunkal rash, a rash on the arms and the and the legs uh, and the palms and the soles. You, it's just about always a face sparing. Um, and typically it's not an icteric rash, it's not icteric, it's just, and again, that sort of leads to being a bit under-recognized and patients being unconcerned because it's, it's not itchy, it's not bothering them. Um, 
because it's a disseminated infection, people can get quite sick. So people can feel you know, tired, lethargic, generally malaised, even febrile, uh, even a pharyngitis, and have some generalised lymphadenopathy. Um, and it's, all, it's good to look out for some other signs, such as mucus patches, that, like the likes of the, the mouth, as I showed in that slide before, or the inguinal or perianal area, um, uh, condylometer lata, and some patchy alopecia, uh, which we've seen a case of just recently. Um, uh, sometimes people can get a unilateral deafness, um, or they can get uh, optic, neuritis, optic neuritis, or um, uh, coming with a, a unilateral red eyes and, and have, uh, or bilaterally, or have u uveitis. Yeah. Um, in secondary syphilis, the serology is it will all be positive, um, and including the RPR. The IPR, RPR theta is typically high in secondary syphilis. Um, and they may even have a, a mild transaminitis representing a, a mild hepatitis. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm just going to, I've just put in here a table. Uh, they're just, these are just a, some, some, a snapshot of some cases um, that I've put together. And there is a bit of a focus, there's a focus, these are all uh, cases in women. Um, and the, the point of them is to highlight uh, some of the characteristics and their features that are, are problematic and uh, uh, why they lead to later presentations or misdiagnoses. So, um, look, the, fir the first case is, um, is a woman in her mid-20s. Um, she presented to our clinic. She was referred by actually the Aboriginal Medical Centre. And she uh, had an RPR of 256. Um, and she, uh, the, the features of this case uh, were that she um, uh, was, you know, she, she went to, went to the centre because she was, she was pregnant, so she booked in for her first antenatal screen. Um, but she was very hard to get into our clinic, so she was hard to contact. She kept changing her appointments. Um, she had two children already, two very young children, two, one, one four and one one, so very busy um, to change appointments. I had to had to wait for transport, um, and uh, so very challenging. At the same time, she we wanted her partner to come in to be screened and of course uh, tested. Uh, uh, while she was being seen, I was seeing her. He was on the phone, texting her, calling her, uh, abusing her a bit. Uh, he didn't want to come into the clinic, so. Uh, in her case, um, the, one of the main risks was that she had a new partner, only been together for three months. Um, she uh, named as her previous partner one of our other patients, and that he was her supplier of her substance use problem. So she was caught up in the current ice epidemic. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, that was a, a major, major risk for her. Uh, the second case, um, again, presented at eight weeks. She was seen at another hospital, seen, a, seen by a GP in another health district, but uh, not southwest, but adjacent to us. And she was referred to uh, one of the smaller hospitals um, when her RPI came back as one, one in 128. Um, uh, she was Australian-born, but Pacific Islander background um, and very well-informed and very good health knowledge and health literacy, good at seeking health services. But her risk essentially was she met a new man, a new boyfriend that had been together likewise for three months um, and, uh, and so fallen pregnant with him. Uh, and while she didn't have any issues with substances, uh, he did. And he'd only recently arrived from, from overseas. Um, uh, so the third case, um, I'll talk about is is a, a woman who was who had a disrupted antenatal care because she moved into state, um, and so uh, as it turned out, she actually didn't make it to um, a, an antenatal care booking uh, at one of our big hospitals until she was thirty four weeks, um, and so uh, so for her. Um, uh, she she did have her first antenatal booking at Interstate in Victoria, but um, 
after investigation, her syphilis serology was overlooked. It wasn't done. Um, and so we found that at 34 weeks, it was the first finding, really, that she had uh, her syphilis serology was positive with an RPR, a low T, that was four. Um, and uh, for her, though, there were some barriers about going to adult, antenatal care, coming to the clinic, and also to her partner was sort of uh, just generally unconcerned and didn't think that he would be a problem or need treatment. So that story's ended well. She's actually now delivered and her baby is well. Her baby doesn't have, is not a case of congenital syphilis. Um, and her partner was serologically negative. And so it would seem to me that this case just briefly um, had perhaps been inadvertently treated previously um, uh, for the infection. Um, happy to take questions about that case later. Um, uh, look, the next case is a, a case of a, a 38 year old woman who is not pregnant. And um, so she was referred to our clinic um, from um, having been released from prison. She had a short stay in prison for some, some activity, let's say. Uh, she went to a GP with some genital lesions and her RPR was high at 256. So the picture was that she'd had recent primary syphilis. Um, uh, she was drug using, as was her partner. Um, and the, again, it was, the issue was ice. Um, and so her partner did come in, they were both treated. Um, and um, so they'll be followed up. But uh, I suppose in short, what's remarkable, we weren't seeing cases like these, uh, because I've been, as it's been said in the introduction, and you can tell by looking at me, I've been doing this for a long time, and um, we haven't been seeing cases like this in young heterosexual women. Um, uh, the, the last case, just before we move on, is um, a case um, of a woman who, who, uh, was was um, presented to hospital, was admitted, was seen by her optometrist. She she was complaining of um, visual field changes and loss of vision, blurred vision. Optometrist referred to to ED, so she was she was admitted, seen by the eye clinic, and she was found to have papilledema and from optic neuritis. So she had acute, essentially acute neurosyphilis, um, only two months postpartum. Um, and so she also had disrupted antenatal care to a degree because she was had the initial management elsewhere. Um, and she, while she had early antenatal screening, uh, she didn't have second or latter screening for syphilis later on in the pregnancy. Um, and so she, she um, delivered, of course, not knowing that she had syphilis in the latter half of her pregnancy. Uh, the answer, to the, she, her partner was in residential rehab, for, again, for drug use. Um, and uh, as this turned out, she found it very difficult to tell the staff on the ward that whilst he was away and on, on rehab, that she did have another partner and that that's where the syphilis would seem to have come from. So she quite early syphilis um, uh, in probably the second trimester. So in short, it's, it's very concerning. Uh, the infections around, the case numbers are growing and um, women and heterosexual men aren't very aware at this stage. Um, um, so, um, so this is, look, just a, this is the case I started off with. So um, just to really, again, just to illustrate the case that it's, that the infection is around. So basically uh, this, this young lady, she delivered, delivered in January 21, healthy baby. She was trepidant or negative throughout the pregnancy. And she had a, a routine antenatal care and she had, so she had the early syphilis screening, but not thereafter. Um, so she was seen by her GP and found to have an RPR of 32. Um, and that was when her baby was three months old. Um, and she gave a vague history that she perhaps did have a vaginal sore. Um, so the GP referred her to our clinic. And uh, so we saw both of them. Her partner was asymptomatic. Her serology was fully reactive. So all of the trepidimal and the RPR were reactive. Uh, he had a non reactive RPR, so perhaps suggesting that uh, he was just seroconverting. Um, so they were treated and we arranged for their baby to be tested and the baby is, is clear and not a case of congenital syphilis. Um, 
uh, sure enough, she was referred back to the clinic again, but by a different GP. And I think that's important. Um, she went to a, a new dental practice complaining of some lesions in her mouth, as you've got here, uh, which weren't healing. And so the GP said, I've never seen this case before, but I don't know what it is. I thought it was thrush. It's not getting any better. But uh, so, so sure enough, she um, had uh, some mucus patches on her on her lips and her buccal mucosa and which of which you can see there's one above the front dentition and one off to the left side of her upper lip um uh and her rpi was her rpi was high it was 128 and her partner again was zero positive um so uh, she's um, she's now pregnant again, and the good news is that she's been followed up and she's remained uh, um, successfully treated. Okay, so but I'm going to come back to the the serology interpretation. Look, just um, uh, firstly, there's uh, the one approach is just to think of the syphilis testing as trepanemal specific and the non trepanemal test. So, firstly, um, the trepanemal specific tests uh, are they really they used to to screen in or to rule out syphilis. So, they're these are the tests that in your labs you'll know them as either the uh, in the enzyme immunoassay or the EIA or the chemiluminescence uh, uh, IA test, the CMIA. Um, so the travel name was specific. They stay positive for life. Um, and other tests they're listed on the on the on the table here um, are the TPPA, the FTA. The immunoblot test is a is a sort of a tertiary level differentiating test to to sort out the discrepant results. Um, so. Overall, trepanemal-specific tests, they're straightforward. Um, and their main use is to be able to say, yes, there's been syphilis or there hasn't been. Otherwise, they're not that useful. So um, look, the, this case here briefly, it's a young woman who we saw, she was eight weeks gestation uh, and her syphilis screen at, it was positive at the EIA test, but her RPI was non-reactive and her TPPA was non-reactive. So we went on, and to do a syphilis immunoblot test and an FTA, and that was they were all negative. So she was advised that this is probably a false positive, um, but to to even consider treatment, given that she was pregnant, she flatly refused. Um, and but she has remained negative. So so just um uh, so now more moves on to the RPR test, and I know this is is can be a challenging point for practitioners at some stage. So, so, so what is the RPR um, and what's its role? So look, it's a, what I've done here in the slide, in the, in the, in the image, I, um, and acknowledgements to Liverpool Hospital Pathology, who provided this, this RPR test card. So, and I'll step you through it. So basically it's a very old test. It's a very old fashioned test, but it's the, the test that we're still dependent upon. So it's a manual test. It's an on bench test. So it's a visual test. It's, um, uh, but it does provide a teeter. So it provides a level. So, so basically what, what they do in the lab is they they take the patient's serum and they they dilute it by a certain amount and they they um, um, they place it on circle number one here and they they put a, a same amount of the the test antigen um, um, onto uh, onto 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 wall number one and they look for uh, uh, agglutination or flocculation. If you can see all the all the little dots um, around the circle, so they're they're all the they're flocculation or the antibodies and the antigen complex um, visually um, um, mixing and and showing up. So they they then to get their teeter, they take an aliquot of that, place it on circle number two, and again mix that um, and dilute it again, and they keep going down each circle. Um, until there's no more uh, agglutination, no more reaction, um, and in the top, the, the top row is is a is one particular patient, and the bottom row is another patient. That's just how they do it. And so, um, in the middle, you've got it says here that the, the, the teeters written by hand are one in one, one in two, one in four, one in eight, and one in sixteen. So, um, on the 
for case number one, the top row, the theta is certainly one in eight. And for case number two, the theta is goes right out to one in 16. So I hope that makes some sense. That's that's kind of how they read it. And then they get another scientist to come over and then double check and check for interoperator variation. Um, so um, basically what we look for is the, the utility of the theta. Um, we use it to monitor for successful response to treatment by demonstrating a fourfold uh, drop or fall in the theta. And in the case of reinfection, uh, we, we likewise look to see if there's a rising theta. And in some slides and cases I have later, we'll, we'll come to those. Um, so, but, um, uh, so two dilutions is equivalent to, so, so two circles away, if you like, is a fourfold change. So um, if you take, for example, circle number two, um, that's a one in two, and then two circles away, that's a four, two times four is eight, or circle number three um, is you know, four times six, four is, is a fourfold is, that takes you up to 16 and so on. Um, Additionally, the theta gives a, a, an idea of disease, disease activity. So as a ballpark figure, um, a theta less than one in eight um, may correlate with inactive disease, but above that, you're suspicious that someone's got active disease, yeah. Um, okay, so we'll go on. So this, this graph is really saying the same thing. Um, and, um, and there's just sort of mapping out what the twofold versus fourfold and eightfold theta is. So um, if you treat a patient, going to the, the lower bar, if you treat a patient and they start off with a theta of one in 32 and they come down to one in four, you know it's greater than one in four, fourfold theta drop. It's even one in eight, it's an eightfold theta drop. So it's very successful. So, okay. So, um, uh, look, I, I'm just, um, this is just a, a case, a male case. And um, uh, Lucy, I might just check in with you because uh, what I could perhaps do if I'm going to, because uh, I'm taking more time than what I feel like I should be. Um, because um, perhaps it may be wise for me to do, you know, two or three more slides. Because yeah. even though tonight we've got to focus on pregnancy and heterosexual transmission, this is a male case. And so this is a 36 year old man. Uh, he, he, um, He's been to our clinic at least twice now. So um, he first came in January 19, 2019. He had a checkup. He was negative. He came back in May 21 with penile ulcers. And at that visit, um, he had a syphilis, a PCR from the penis, which was positive, And he had a low RPR teeter. Sometimes when people have a present with a shanker, the teeter's just zero converting for the RPR. But the EIA test will probably be positive. So he was treated with benzathine penicillin. He was meant to come back for follow-up, but he didn't. So it's a bit of an issue is what we're talking about tonight. Uh, I saw him again recently and, and in the text, um, he's, been, he's been on dating apps and he's had some paid sex. So he's paid some sex workers, many partners, always condomless himself, no use of drugs, but he said his partners that he's been many casually. Sometimes they seem to be on drugs. Um, uh, socially, he's been under a lot of pressure with his business, separated from his, his wife and, and a lot of family tension. Um, but uh, just to, um, so he'll be followed up again and we'll be demonstrating, hoping to demonstrate that he's having a fourfold teeter drop. Um, just another brief male case. Uh, so 32 year old man admitted to one of the big hospitals here um, and he had a fever and a widespread rash. It was unknown to cause. So he was worked up, ultimately found to have an RPR of 256. Similar story, very active sexually, um, single, but on dating apps and paid sex with one semi-regular girlfriend. Again, no condoms, many partners. Um, a feature about this man was he was a bit of a traditional heterosexual man in a way, if I can say that with some caveats. Um, he was a bit of a, um, he had sort of traditional masculinities kind of concept about himself. And he, he was, he had, you know, some attitudes to women and some minority groups. Um, it was difficult to work with him to a degree around contact tracing. Um, and uh, it was evident that 
essentially he was he would have been passing on the infection whilst whilst he was infectious this i'll come back to the other cases later but this is um a 35 year old woman who um who's been trying for pregnancy um so they first came in um uh in in september 20 uh she was negative at that stage um and so she came uh, along with her partner in December 21, because her partner had been referred to us by the blood bank. He is a regular blood donor, so regular donations and screening. And he was found at blood bank to be to be positive. Um, he had a, he had an RPR of one in 64. So she came along, and she gave a history of a recent rash, and she had an RPR which is very high, of 512. Um, look, um, the point of this slide really is to, in part, to demonstrate her serological decline. So her, her RPR has declined and stayed down after all repeat visits as she's gone on to IVF. Um, and um, so she's well and truly had a fourfold a drop in her teeter. So, okay, so, so Lucy, what about if I stop there, do you think? And we um, keep, we, we may want to take over. Yep. So there are a couple of questions, but I might just let everyone know that we'll hold the questions and, and come back to those at the end of the session, if everyone's okay with that. Yep. Thanks, Lucy. Probably helpful segueing from the cases that Dr. Carmody has just discussed, in, including the male cases, because we're mindful tonight that some of you might be antenatal share care providers and some of you might not. So you might be sitting there going, I don't see a huge amount of of pregnant people, but what you're going to be seeing um, importantly is their partners possibly. So it's nice that we've kind of just touched on those male cases. So as mentioned, my name is Cherie. I wear a few hats. Um, I work as a clinical nurse specialist at Sydney Sexual Health Centre. So I see a lot of syphilis and have done for many years. And my primary patient group are men who have sex with men, um, sex workers and young people. Um, I also work at ASHAM as their medical educator. That's the Australasian Society for HIV medicine, um, sexual health and viral hepatitis. Um, and I'm at the Kirby Institute. Um, so really, I'm just sort of going to be talking to what um, Dr. Carmody has talked about, but just really alerting everyone to current updates in terms of guidelines and what we're all to be aligning to. Um, I won't go into, if you're interested in NASHAM, I will put the link in the chat box so you can have a look because they do lots of training and education as well, specifically on bloodborne viruses, HIV, sexually transmitted infections. Now, just bring us all to the New South Wales guidelines and where we're to be working and, and um, the realm we're meant to be working in. Just to reiterate um, what Dr. Carmody was saying around the data, it's not, um, it's not the most positive data in that we're seeing the annual trends in syphilis changing. Um, they're still driven by males. However, the rates of infectious syphilis are increasing in females. And for obvious reasons that we're here tonight, that's very concerning. And um, the highest and most concerning increases we're seeing are among women of reproductive age. So that core group between 15 and 40. And further to that, we're seeing the most substantial increases among the 25 to 29 years um, age group. So as mentioned, um, and just putting into words some of the graph that Dr. Carmody presented in 2022, in New South Wales, we had 153 women of reproductive age with infectious syphilis, 24 of whom were pregnant at the time of diagnosis. So I guess the good thing is we're catching, they were caught in pregnancy, but, um, you know, we, we did see that data before around congenital syphilis and we're having congenital syphilis um, cases and really it's just a tip of the iceberg in terms of health system failures and we'll talk around that. Now, some of you may or may not be aware the PHN circulated this. It got circulated very widely. So the Clinical Excellence Commission um, had a safety information alert that was released on the 7th of November in 2022. And the crux of that alert was really around increased universal screening for syphilis infection in pregnancy. What that actually meant for us in practice was that all women, pregnant women for syphilis are to be screened at least twice 
during their pregnancy. So that has changed from the previous guideline, which was for pregnant people to be screened once. And now they're talking um, as well, again, at the 26 and 28 weeks mark as well. Further to that, though, um, all pregnant women who have received minimal or no antenatal care or at risk of missing an appointment should be opportunistically screened at the service they present at, regardless of gestation. And I think this really points to the important role um, GPs are playing in this space and, and, you know, us not making assumptions around a pregnant person that they are, are possibly engaged in antenatal care. A lot of reviews that are happening across the jurisdictions outside New South Wales as well, what they're finding is these cases of congenital syphilis um, or syphilis in pregnancy, that these people have presented elsewhere for other aspects of care, not necessarily the pregnancy, um, but it's been a, a, where they've engaged with care. So it's included in emergency departments, drug and alcohol, mental health and general practice, importantly. So when you're seeing a pregnant person, I guess it's around not making assumptions they're engaging in antenatal care um, and asking the question and normalising that, um, that, you know, not everyone does, why you're here today. The other part of this alert that was placed was if in the case you do come across a, um, a pregnant person with syphilis um, to consult with your sexual health clinic, so um, reaching out to someone like Dr. Carmody to alert them that this is what you've found and guidance from there or infectious diseases clinicians as well or with your um, tertiary hospitals um, because obviously what we, we don't want at that point is that pregnant person to slip through the cracks. Um, and obviously if it's an Aboriginal um, patient as well, if you have an Aboriginal health liaison office or anything like that, but the importance of culturally appropriate refer referral pathways is really, really paramount at that time. So that was really the summary of that alert that went out in um, November. And obviously that's a significant change to what the guidelines were. And as an example, in other jurisdictions, the screening of um, syphilis in pregnancy has been further increased from that. As an example, in WA, they're doing up to five tests throughout the pregnancy. Um, so I guess it reminds us as clinicians not to also ignore your clinical intuition. Yes, while the guidance is saying two tests in pregnancy, there's nothing to stop you doing more if you suspect um, that it may be of benefit to the patient. I think one of the things we need to be really mindful of is, okay, this is not what we do all the time. I mean, Dr. Carmody, Michelle and myself can talk about syphilis, no end, we see it, we're dealing with it. Um, it's part of our every day, um, but we're very aware and cognizant of the fact it's not necessarily yours. So if, if you come across this and you're not sure what to do, as an example, in New South Wales, there's the New South Wales Sexual Health Info Link. Um, that phone line is a statewide service. And as a clinician, you get prioritized in the phone order if you dial in because it's assumed you're possibly with a patient and needing that information in a timely fashion. Um, that phone line... Um, is it sits within Sydney Sexual Health Centre. It's a separate service, but it's there. And the reason I'm telling you that is I, you know, by here just organically the calls that come in because those nurses are in an office that we sometimes share and we get a lot of calls about syphilis. You can see by the start of the talk, the serology can be very confusing, the staging of someone which dictates the length of treatment they require. Um, so this phone line runs hot a lot with syphilis questions. Um, so please utilise that phone line if you're ever, and they can also guide you within your LHD where you might, if you need more assistance as well. I guess the other thing as clinicians, we're always looking for clinical tools or that guidance. So there's a couple of ones I just will alert you to tonight. Um, and uh, firstly, the Australian uh, SDI management guidelines for use in primary care, having that saved to your desktop can be very helpful. It's quite, I think I'm biased because obviously I look at it all the time, even as a clinician who works in this specialty. It is, and we all use these guidelines and sometimes they're a bit clunky and not intuitive. It's a very intuitive guideline. You can look at in terms of the syndrome someone presents with the symptoms, the SDI, and it, and it will outline everything you need to do. ASHAM also have some decision-making tools in syphilis, which is because, um, as you saw, that the serology can be a little bit challenging to interpret. These, again, are quite intuitive and talk the clinician through the stages as well, and they can be used as well as an educational resource. 
one thing that um, those decision making tools, they're now interactive, which can be quite helpful when you're in kind of the moment and you're trying to work out the next steps for your patient um, as well. So just to speak before I wrap up, so I'm really about just putting the context around, okay, where are the guidelines? What are we to be looking at? And, you know, the, the most current practice, just to track back to the last two cases that Dr. Carmody talked to in regards to those male um, cases, historically a routine asymptomatic um, SDI checkup for, as an example, a heterosexual male, um, as at a minimum was to include the uh, urine test for chlamydia. The Australian SEI management guidelines have been updated. In November 2022, the new updates um, were released. And importantly, um, routine, so standard asymptomatic checkups across the board now need to be including HIV and syphilis serology um, because as you can see, the rise of syphilis notifications in Australia and particularly the population groups we're now seeing it in, we need to ensure that we're doing this broadly across the board. So I hope I've given some context to, um, I guess, the guidelines that they were, we're all working with now. Um, we are aware that you may not be an antenatal share care provider, but you will be seeing pregnant people and importantly, you will be seeing their partners. Um, Dr. Carmen and I and myself, we, you know, are very grateful when people come into publicly funded sexual health clinics, but, you know, a lot of people actually actually access general practice because they don't realise their own risks. So you are doing the bulk of the hard work for us. Um, and we're very grateful for that. So, um, yes, I hope that has sort of consolidated the current guidelines and where we're at. Um, if you have any questions, obviously feel free um, to reach out to me and make sure you have a look at ASHAM in terms of um, upcoming training. There's a lot of work happening in the CIFLA space and more broadly. So thanks very much. I'll hand over um, to Michelle now. Thanks, Dr. Dunn. While that's coming up and you're doing that, I'll, I will answer one of the questions in the chat box um, around do we need to do a second test in, even if they've only had one partner? It is now routine to do that second test. It's part of the clinical recommendations because I guess that's possibly where we're falling unstuck and people are falling through the cracks. Um, they may be only having one partner, but that partner that they're with may be having multiple partners. So there's lots of layers that we can't, I guess, assume. So the guidelines are very clear now um, to test during pregnancy and more if um, you're clinically, you know, suspicious of more. Thanks, Michelle. Which leads me into, I suppose, my role. So I'm one of the maternal fetal medicine fellows at Liverpool Hospital. And so we see the referrals usually after some antenatal screening is returned a positive result or if there's um, a patient that may have some ultrasound features suggestive for congenital syphilis. Uh, and so I thought we might start with a historical case. Um, this is not a patient I was personally involved with, but um, kindly uh, Dr Carmody passed on her information. So I've able, been able to put this together today. Um, patient VA is a 25-year-old G2P1. She was New Zealand born and came to Australia seven years prior to this, uh, the pregnancy we're going to discuss. Uh, her and her partner are of Pacific Islander descent. Um, her first pregnancy was relatively unremarkable. She was a late booker at 37 weeks and presented to Hospital A for that booking. Um, not long after that, she presented to Hospital B in labour and proceeded to have an elective caesar for her breech presentation baby. Uh, the pregnancy really um, that we'll highlight in this discussion was her subsequent pregnancy. Uh, again, she was a late booker in this pregnancy, came to a GP at about 30 weeks uh, and very diligently they performed all of her bloods and investigations and referred her on to the local hospital. Had an ultrasound scan for the first time in that pregnancy at about 31 weeks. So an averagely grown baby, 1.8 kilos. Uh, no concerning features noted at that time, normal AFI and Dopplers. Uh, she then went to Hospital B where she delivered her first baby at about 32 weeks. Uh, at the time, they didn't have any bloods available. I think they also performed some investigations as well. Uh, and the patient had been uh, in the interim contacted, diagnosed with a syphilis infection and was uh, referred promptly onto the sexual health clinic. Um, as per the documentation, she had her first dose of benzyl penicillin at approximately 33 weeks, um, but unfortunately didn't attend her second and third appointments at the sexual health clinic. 
she then proceeded uh, to go into spontaneous labour at 34 plus three weeks. And what is a little bit complicating is that she presented via ambulance to Hospital C. So she was not known to this hospital and they didn't have all her antenatal investigations at the time of labour. Um, it was a quick labour, it was three hours, and she had a spontaneous vaginal birth of a live female infant who was an averagely growing baby, 65th centile, 2.29 kilos. Uh, baby documented to have had APGARS 9 and 9. Uh, there was a um, bit of a rise in the lactate of 8.2 at the time with a low pH at birth. Um, the team uh, did their due diligence, uh, confirmation that she had active syphilis with incomplete treatment prior to delivery. And so her maternal serology, there was syphilis, EIA, total antibody, um, fluorescent treponeal antibody, and her TPPA in vitro were all reactive, and her RPR title was 64. The placenta was sent off for histopathology, um, which confirmed an acute subchorionitis and focal uh, velitis. There was some abscess formation there, but it didn't look like they sent off um, syphilis PCR testing for that placenta. Um, baby was looked after in the nursery at this hospital, um, and they did the appropriate investigations for congenital syphilis. Uh, so there's treponema IgM positivity. The baby's time at day one post-birth was 16. The baby went on to have CSF analysis at day two and day five post-birth. Uh, the fluorescent treponeal antibody was reactive, TPPA non-reactive, and the CSF vidrol was reactive, but it was noted to be a potential contaminant from a traumatic lumbar puncture. Bub's blood cultures were negative. Um, the long bone X-rays were consistent with findings related to congenital syphilis, and I'll go through some of those findings again later. Uh, head ultrasound was um, NAD, normal liver function at the time, and the screening, the newborn screening test was negative, but um, obviously there's some follow-up in the future for that as well. Uh, baby completed a 10-day course of antibiotics, uh, and there was a plan for baby to have some follow-up with RPR titers uh, beyond delivery. Um, the difficult part of that is that um, the baby's care was then transferred to Hospital D, uh, a children's hospital uh, in New South Wales. So I unfortunately wasn't able to access many of the files for the baby um, beyond that um, initial referral there. Uh, and thankfully, she has had another pregnancy and another baby, uncomplicated and no um, congenital syphilis for their third child. And so I thought I'd just generally, you know, I'll put a little bit of a, I suppose, my spin on syphilis in pregnancy and congenital syphilis. Um, it is tricky because uh, these patients often, like we've discussed, have um, painless lesions. They typically heal spontaneously, um, even in the absence of any treatment or seeking any medical attention. And not all of these lesions are external, so they may be on the vaginal or cervical epithelium as well, so the patients may not even be aware of a lesion, uh, but typically the findings or features are similar to the non-pregnant patient. Um, we really want to know about them, so it's really important because we have the ability to, we have a good treatment if we find a positive patient, um, and we have a really, um, I suppose, a significant role in looking after this patient, not just for this pregnancy, but for future pregnancies as well. And we know that if there's congenital syphilis that's either um, unrecognised or undertreated, that it is associated with pregnancy loss, preterm birth, stillbirth, uh, small babies, congenital infection and neonatal mortality. And so the guideline that I suppose is our Bible from an obstetric point of view, and I think probably a lot of GPs have come across the ACID guidelines, so the perinatal infection guideline that's driven by a lot of the infectious diseases um, specialists through Australia, and it's recently been revised in 2022. Um, it's a really lovely summary about what to do with a lot of the potential um, infections encountered in pregnancy. Um, and so, well, I won't go through screening and that's something we've largely covered, but I'll just, will, I suppose, rehash that um, we are now, um, we've recognised that traditionally there's an at-risk population um, and it's listed just to the right-hand side there, but we're universally screening at 26 to 28 weeks. We don't want to make assumptions about patients' relationships, especially with a disease that potentially has very significant um, implications for a fetus. Um, there is a little note to say, consider repeating the test at 34 to 36 weeks if you have any concerns, and I suppose that goes with trust your gut. Um, and again, later in the pregnancy, if there's anything that's really um, standing out to you, you think this patient might be at increased risk. And I suppose there are a column of risk factors there um, on the right-hand side as well. 
Um, we try and time the repeat serology at 26 to 28 weeks because at times when patients are really likely to have their antenatal bloods repeated. So we often put it on OGTs to sleep. It's a good time. We see them often, depending on their risk factors in pregnancy, um, they're likely to see um, their healthcare provider, either us in hospital, their midwives, their GP or whoever is caring for them in pregnancy. And I've noticed since working at Liverpool Hospital, there's a really high incidence of patients that are really late presenters. And so they often come through the emergency department. They may have some preterm labour. They may have some bleeding. And even from our point of view, I suppose, we've really tried to re-educate our team as well, the importance of um, these late booking patients who often have um, a lot of other vulnerabilities there. Uh, that it's really important to remember to do syphilis testing. Um, and I think we do forget from our end because we don't often um, order the initial um, screening bloods. And so I think we're getting a little bit better at it. And I must say the GPs in the community are absolutely excellent at doing these screening tests as well. So thank you. Um, and then I suppose once you've got a, a screen positive test result, referring in having confirmation tests and, um, you know, having a very multidisciplinary multidisciplinary team involved in their care and it's certainly the infectious diseases team largely drives this. Um, from an intrauterine, I suppose a fetal compartment perspective, um, congenital, sorry, um, syphilis infection in pregnancy can be associated with fetal demise up to 40% reported. Obviously, if we know about it and we treat in pregnancy, the prognosis is much better. Um, we're good at ultrasound, but we're not perfect. The more ultrasounds I do, the more I worry I miss. And so we know that neonates that do have um, gone to have a diagnosis of congenital syphilis don't have any prenatal ultrasound-based findings. And we think that, you know, even 12% of um, babies with a normal sonogram will have a diagnosis of congenital syphilis post-delivery. I won't go into stages of infection, um, but I think we've, we've covered that quite effectively. And so I like to think about infections in pregnancy, about how they cross or affect the fetus and what complications that can cause. And so the treponeal infection can cross the placenta as early as the ninth week in pregnancy. And I think that's really important to remember that there's that, that mother-baby relationship. Um, it is influenced by sorry, the gestational age and infection. So the later in pregnancy, the more likely infection is to occur, fetal infection. Um, it depends very much on the stage of maternal syphilis. So obviously, if you're in the earlier years of the diagnosis or um, from primary infection, you're more likely to be infectious um, versus um, a few years down the track. Um, maternal infection history is really important. Um, and how the fetus actually responds to a congenital infection changes the prognosis in pregnancy as well. So the thought is that fetal abnormalities or the findings that we traditionally see associated with congenital syphilis are largely driven by the fetal inflammatory response uh, to the treponeal infection. Um, that can either cross the placenta or a syphilis infection can occur directly from traversing the fetal membranes to infect the fluid, therefore the fetus. And we know that as part of the birthing um, process that the baby can be infected during the actual birth itself. Uh, the way it affects the fetus is a few different things and it's a little bit additive in some cases and I think that's why we see so much morbidity and potential loss of a fetus in this set of circumstances. Uh, once the placenta is infected um, and the fetal circulation is involved, we know that if the baby can have hepatic infection and dysfunction. Um, it, it causes an amniotic fluid infection. It can certainly cause some hematological abnormalities. So we know the fetus is prone to having anemia and thrombocytopenia. Um, this can be part of the driving force behind the ascites and the hydropic changes that we see. Um, we know some of the hepatomegaly is secondary to an acute syphilitic hepatitis of the fetus. Um, when there's an anemia present, obviously that further compounds the hepatomegaly and splenomegaly that we see. And um, the treponeal infection can directly cause a myocarditis of the uh, fetus as well. And that um, also is a bit of an additive factor in the cardiac failure and the hydrops we see in these fetuses. Um, like we were saying before, a lot of the, the risk is in an earlier infection. So 50% risk of congenital infection um, for primary and secondary untreated syphilis, 40% with early late and untreated syphilis, and about 10% with late untreated syphilis. Um, 
and the frequency of vertical transmission actually increases with increasing gestational age at maternal acquisition. Uh, generally speaking, we don't really see ultrasound findings of this congenital infection until about after 20 weeks of pregnancy. So when there's a confirmed maternal infection, we like to screen these patients regularly. Um, generally speaking, if there is a case of congenital syphilis, we'll just see ultrasound findings. Hepatomegaly and placentomegaly are the more early findings. And certainly if we're seeing some of these changes, they're one of the things we think about testing maternal syphilis. Um, later stage signs would be anemia, ascites and high drops, and that's really when the infection's uh, a little bit further along. Um, an abnormal ultrasound is not diagnostic of a fetal infection, but we can certainly suspect it, and a normal ultrasound doesn't mean that there's no fetal infection. So I just thought I'd put some images of things that we see. Um, I find this interesting. Uh, hepatomegaly in 83% of cases, sometimes there's a splenomegaly associated with that as well. Um, placenta megaly is relatively common in about one third of the time. Uh, we can see indirect features uh, of anemia on ultrasound in 38% of patients, poly in about 10 and growth restriction in 14. Hydrops in 12%, so skin edema, pericardial effusion, and size would be the more common hydropic features we see. I think it's important to remember, and I think someone asked about torch screening, that torch actually doesn't have an S in it, so we call it Storch screening. In fact, syphilis is probably one of the more useful tests. We, we don't get a lot of utility out of a lot of the other infections that we screen for. Um, and even though it has a very small association with growth restriction, that certainly wasn't the pattern that we were seeing in the patient we presented earlier. It should be a trigger to test for that. Sometimes we find non-specific anomalies in the fetus and we think that infection could be a cause. We certainly, that's one of the first things we send off um, when we see our patients. And I suppose this is just the ACID guidelines that reinforces that the earlier the infection is, the higher risk of fetal infection. So when we have a chat with mums and they're worried about the potential implications to their fetus, mm -hmm. depending on the stage of the infection for mum, we can give them a little bit of an idea of, of risk. But certainly when it's been picked up and treated appropriately, you've got a little bit of a time frame between diagnosis and delivery, and we're not seeing any fetal side effects at that point in time, I suppose we can be... Um, a little bit reassuring with that picture. Um, it's the one thing I know with treatment that if there is a penicillin hypersensitivity that we would very strongly push and talk to our immunology friends about um, sensitizing, oh, sorry, desensitizing, very importantly, desensitizing to penicillin so that um, the patient in front of us uh, can have appropriate treatment. Um, and we can monitor treatment efficacy um, by monitoring the drop in the titers um, or maternal serology, but that is also under the presumption that we've got enough pregnancy to really track that along over time. Uh, and really there's been more of a push to, um, instead of just, I suppose, the single um, course, having a repeat IM dose of benzathine penicillin as well. Um, and ACID guidelines covers that quite nicely as to the, the risk um, of um, treatment failure, if that makes sense. Uh, I stole this <laughs> photo of Dr. Carmody, but I, I just thought it was a, a nice one to add here. Um, so if we know about maternal infection, especially with our late booking patients not long before they deliver, then they've got a much higher risk of congenital infection. Um, inpatient versus outpatient. So we like to think of it as if the baby is a potentially a gestation, if there was some distress uh, secondary to one of the reactions we can see to this treatment, um, that we like to monitor how the fetus tolerates that. Um, and I'm going to pronounce this totally wrong and I'm very sorry, but the jarish Perksheimer reaction are probably, sorry, probably occurs about up to 45% um, of our patients that are treated in pregnancy. It's short-lived, it's supportive management, but sometimes they can feel a bit um, diaphoretic, they can be tachycardic, hypotensive, and generally resolves with time. Um, we do know that sometimes some of our fetuses don't tolerate well with significant maternal hypertensive or tachycardic events. And that's why we just make sure the fetal compartment's managing the treatment okay. But certainly the bigger risk is not treating um, and the potential implications of that as well. And uh, I suppose when the baby is born, it's really important that we continue to look after and communicate well with the team that look after the baby. So the paediatricians are involved um, and making sure they're aware of the maternal infection. So we're really doing due diligence for the baby that is born. 
Um, it's a combination of infant serology, um, like we mentioned before with the, the baby we discussed earlier, a clinical examination. So those typical findings, the paddosplenomegaly, and I've got some photos soon. Uh, and placental histopathology and really asking the pathology team to perform a PCR if we think it's appropriate for the case. Um, there's a pretty comprehensive list of serology that we perform, um, mostly what we covered a little bit earlier as well. Treatment for the infant, there's a, a bit of a, a recommended treatment plan. Um, for babies that um, we suspect there is congenital syphilis, it's a pretty close follow-up program. So they're often reviewed at one, two, four, six, and 12 months of age. And they're looking at their response to titers. Um, and I suppose they've got some potential ongoing long-term sequelae that need follow-up too. Uh, for the babies that we don't find any abnormal serology, abnormal examination or placental findings, they still have some follow-up um, at three and six months afterwards. If that remains negative, the conclusion is they're not infected, no further action uh, is necessary. I know it's probably that time of night, hopefully you've all eaten dinner. I'm sorry about some of these slides, but this is a, an image from one of our uh, maternal fetal medicine textbooks of a stillbirth in the third trimester. Um, and you can see there's a pretty significant hepatosplenomegaly and some hydropic change in that fetus. Um, from congenital syphilis, I suppose, what does that look like or what does that mean? Um, and there's some pretty characteristic skin lesions and rashes, um, the squamating type uh, skin pathology um, that may be seen. Um, there's a bit of a syphilitic rhinitis, and so there can be some significant nasal secretions from the neonate. There's some typical bone-related changes that our earlier case had. Um, and uh, they, in this case, there was some diminished, just in this little photo, they've got us an example from the CDC website, uh, a diminished density in the ends of the shaft and destruction of the proximal end of the tibia. I can't pronounce some of these orthopedic words, so I won't try. Um, the congenital syphilis, so things that we've just talked about above, but some of the late things, and they call it Hutchison's triad, and I think of it as the wise monkeys, you know, the um, see, hear, um, you know, speak no evil. There's the Hutchinson's incisors, which are these little kind of W-shaped teeth. They've got their little peaks. There's um, an interstitial uh, keratinitis and sensorineural deafness. Um, there's certainly some features, and I suppose as we're getting a little bit more experience with ultrasound too, um, there's some uh, characteristic facial, facial features. So the saddle nose uh, that can be appreciated in the profile, frontal bossing, perforated hard palate and sabre shins. Thankfully, we don't really see a lot of this in Australia. Um, and I think that probably covers most of my involvement um, with syphilis in pregnancy. And I've worked at three, four different, very different sites with very different patient demographics, but the common factor for the cases I've mostly managed have been late diagnosis of syphilis in pregnancy um, with women who seek antenatal care quite late in um, for various different social factors. Thank you, Dr. Dunn.